Welcome to The Exchange, a series of insightful conversations about culture, community, and corporate life with some of the top leaders from Wells Fargo. I'm your host, Kendra Steven. Today, we're going to talk about career rules we have to unlearn and adapt. Welcome to my guests, Tanya Sanders and Salvador Enriquez. Thank you for being here today. Before we begin, let's have a round of introductions. Please share your name and what your role is at Wells Fargo. Let's start with Tanya Sanders. Hi, uh, I'm Tanya Sanders. I am the head of Wells Fargo Auto. We are a business that does car loans for Wells Fargo. And so we do business with over 11,000 dealers and we have over 3 million customers that we service every day. Thank you so much, Tanya. And thank you so much for being here. Hi, Hi, how are you? Thank you for uh, having me today. Um, again, my name is uh, Salvador Enriquez. You can call me Sal. And I'm a supplier diversity manager at Wells Fargo. My role is to make sure that uh, we are purchasing products and services from diverse owned companies, diverse owned companies like Qantas, the people that are behind this production. Um, our goal is to make sure that we're spending more than a billion dollars with diverse suppliers per year. My role is to train those companies that are interested in doing business with Wells Fargo, those diverse owned companies, uh, to uh, manage uh, these uh, contracts that are coming uh, through uh, our supply chain management opportunities. Thank you so much for being here. I was excited to meet both of you because I read your resumes and I was like, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> I know, Ms. Saunders, you are one of the top minority women in the company. And Salvador, you're here getting awards from the U.S. Department of Commerce. You rock stars. I get to interview rock stars today, so I'm super excited. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about that a lot of people don't really um, quite understand when you go through school, especially for me as an attorney, I learned that what I learned in law school was not what, how, how it applied in the real world. Was that like the same thing for you guys where there's a lot of knowledge that you learned in school that there were lessons that you had to relearn in the corporate environment? Yeah, so um, there was a lot for me to unlearn. When I went to school, I started out as a mechanical engineer. And so in the engineering field, it was very much about getting the work done, understanding processes, solving problems. And those are still skills that I use every day um, in banking. However, uh, one of the things that I had to unlearn or learn to do differently is rely on communications and being a better communicator, understanding how the work actually gets done is not by one person trying to be the smartest, um, coming up with the best solution, which is typically what you do in engineering, um, but to work and collaborate with a team of folks to get to an end solution. Um, I also uh, did my business degree about 10 years after I had started my career. And so learned a lot that really helped to connect to the common language in banking, um, understand you know, what are some of the key factors around strategy and business. But at the end of the day, it really does come down to people um, who get a lot of the work done um, here in any business, really. And so just learning to focus in on some of the more human elements, how you connect with people, how you communicate, how do you motivate and inspire people, those are some of the things that I really had to learn differently. You know, I love that you mentioned learn differently. And I think throughout your career, I think people, one, when you're done with school, they think you're done learning, right? But the truth is throughout your career, you're gonna be learning lessons throughout the way. What are some lessons that you've learned in your career journey that you wish you had learned before you had started? I'm gonna let Salvador take this question. There comes a point in your career that um, yes, it's uh, great. We 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 um, we went to school. We got our masters, and then uh, the real world hits you. And that type of knowledge can only come by actually experiencing and learning to do stuff. Um, if I could go and give advice to the young Salvador when he was starting his career, was to ask for help. You know, don't uh, don't take it upon yourself to get these uh, uh, um, uh, these opportunities where where you're going to be tasked uh, with a new challenge and then you think you could do it on your own. It is about building relationships and it is about asking help and saying, hey, can you teach me? Can you train me? Uh, and, and don't assume that you just because you just graduated from a great school and you have your master's that you're going to be able to do it. There are specific ways and practices that are done per company. And so 
uh, as I said, going back in time, I would go and tell, hey, Sal, ask for help. Don't take it upon yourself. Uh, and this is before Google, by the way. So uh, now it's very fortunate that you could go and Google some stuff. But as I said, more knows the devil from being old than from being the devil. I've been doing this for more than 20 years. And I'm now the subject matter expert in my field. And I uh, feel comfortable with the knowledge that you've acquired. Uh, we all suffer from that imposter syndrome where you're like, uh, you know, am I really the, uh, the subject matter expert? And, and, and never stop learning. You know, go back and re-familiarize re yourself with um, the knowledge that is coming up. Uh, we live, uh, we, we work in, in a very fluid field, field uh, uh, as I said, in finance. And, and new technologies are always coming on board. And, and become familiar with them so that you are the best that you can be in the job that you're doing. I love that you mentioned the fact that you want to consider imposter syndrome, but I also heard <laughs> a bit about ego, putting your ego aside and asking for help. So I'm gonna switch to Tanya for a second. Like, Tell me about a time that you learned a lesson that you know, a part of your, your journey that you wish you had learned earlier that had a little bit to do with ego. Well, um, ego is something that all of us have to deal with. And, you know, I think I, as a younger person, always prided myself on being a really hard worker and figuring out the answer and trying to figure out the answer faster than, than everyone else. And that only takes you so far. The lesson I wish I would have learned earlier, and I did learn it about mid-career as I got some feedback, was, look, Tanya, it doesn't help to be the smartest person in the room if other people aren't gonna follow you. So I received some pretty candid feedback around what I would call ego, which was, hey, I had kind of the brain smarts, I know how to get the work done, or I knew how to get the work done, but what I really needed to figure out is how to get the work done with other people and how to bring folks along and not get so far out in front sometimes that um, you're not doing it as a team, um, not collaborating. And so, you know, that's something that I really had to take to heart and spent some time with some really helpful managers at the time who helped me see, you know, these are the things that you should be working with your teammates on before you bring the answer forward. Make sure you've got good alignment and you're, and you're bringing those things together as a fully aligned team. So I, I, that's something I had to deal with from an ego perspective. And it's something that I think many of us have to adjust to um, over time. I love the fact that you mentioned mentorship, leadership. I think those are really great tools to deal with that little green monster we call ego. So I'm gonna ask you, Salvador, I'm gonna switch it over to you for a second. How would you, uh, how would you rate the importance of mentorship for young people wanting to enter the corporate world? So uh, mentorship is extremely important. I've had uh, through my career, some amazing mentors uh, that later uh, became some of my best friends. Uh, and. Even to this day, when um, I'm having an issue with that something that doesn't quite feel well, I could always go back to them and run things by them. And um, it, it, it's phenomenal that we, you know, start where we left off. And the guidance that they give me is extremely important. So much that I've actually implemented within the programs that I have when I'm helping diverse owned companies how to grow their businesses, that we establish mentorship opportunities uh, for these young entrepreneurs. Uh, where they're able to go and run things. Uh, nothing is new under the sun. So if uh, you have uh, an issue, chances are someone else already kind of went through it and they're able to provide valuable guidance. And as I said, um, we know that, uh, for example, in the field that I work, which is uh, working with diverse home companies, those companies that have taken the opportunity to be part of a mentoring program succeed and, and, and are doing better than those that are not uh, in, in taking advantage of the mentoring opportunity. And, and the best thing here is you have people that are very willing to provide you that guidance and advice. And, 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 and it, it, there's no price that, uh, that, that, that can be put to advice that you can actually implement on a solution, by the way, saving you a lot of headaches. <laughs> well, I love what you're saying about not being able to put a price on experience, right? Uh, you mm -hmm. know, I'm mm -hmm. going to confess I am a millennial. 
SEO. And we, we grew up okay. with Google and we think we can search for everything. But I think understanding mm -hmm. that that's the importance of having mentors. Google can only share with you so much. There's so much of their experience and their journey that you're not going to find in those chat rooms, right? And I think that's mm -hmm. been important, even for me. Um, my first mentor in law school, uh, I actually met her when I went to an event and I said, you know, I was getting a scholarship award and I saw that she was on the board for this organization. I'm like, hey, she is a partner in a national law firm. What is she doing? What can I learn from her? And I walked up to her and I said, hey, would you, would you like to mentor me? And she was like, of course I would. And, Till this day, she's still a part of my life. I post pictures, she likes it, we comment, we connect, we chat. And I think a lot of people miss that part of how important a mm -hmm. mentor is to building their career. Uh, Tanya, I know you have a mentor, I hope so. I can tell you did, but you mentioned about mentors when you were you know, dealing with ego issues. And I'm just curious, are you a mentor in, in, in the space now? Yeah, you know, I just, uh, mentors are so important. And the point that you make around just learning from other people's experiences and frankly, sometimes other people's mistakes. So you don't have to relearn those mistakes. Um, I've not only been a mentor and am a mentor, but I've learned a lot from mentors. And I just wanted to share one point. And then one of the things that I share with my mentees that I've also learned over time is when you're picking mentors or when you're trying to find someone to emulate, your mentors don't have to necessarily look like you, have exactly the same career path that you're aspiring. Sometimes you learn from people that are different from you and they can see things from a different perspective that really help with coaching. And when I um, joined the auto finance industry about a little over 15 years ago, um, I had a little bit of culture shock because in the auto industry overall, one, there just weren't, weren't a lot of women leaders, but in auto finance even, just not a lot of um, female leaders or black leaders. And so I looked at the landscape and was pretty intimidated and uncertain about whether or not I wanted to frankly be in the industry. And I gave it a run, I, I did something different, um, but then I had someone reach out to me that was unexpected. Um, white male, didn't have a ton in common as far as our backgrounds, but the one thing that we honed in on is our values were very much aligned. We really uh, um, leaned in on teams. We believed that our business at the time could be successful and we wanted to work well together. And he took the time to really understand why I was uncomfortable um, in the space. I was still getting the work done, but it was clear that I wasn't as connected in the culture. And he became a mentor, someone who had lived the experience, but lived it from a very different lens and point of view that I did. And so that's something that I bring to my mentor now is I try to mentor folks who are not necessarily in auto finance. Some are, but some are not. And I try to give a perspective that's outside of, you know, someone who is trying to do banking or maybe wanting to switch um, careers or, or change functions. And I just try to give my insight on some of the things I've learned along the way and, and some of the mistakes I've made, but some of the things that um, I appreciate now when I, when I have the opportunity to look back. Mentoring is just so important, and I think it is a key component to a successful career. Thank you. Now, Salvador, you've had experience with mentors. What do you feel are the qualities of an effective mentee and mentor in order for it to be a successful relationship? So my job is actually to connect, as I said, uh, young entrepreneurs with important uh, uh, executives within Wells Fargo and beyond Wells Fargo. So I love connecting people. And so uh, uh, following up what Tanya said, I, I, I usually uh, try to make sure that there's diversity uh, within uh, the connection. Uh, I, I think you are going to be learning more uh, uh, from people that come from a different perspective and they have a different way of seeing things than if you have someone with the kind of like the same experience that you have, you already have that knowledge. So, you know, bring in diversity into uh, the connections that you're actually making. So when I make those connections in my mentoring program is making sure that they're able to bring in new ideas. Um, I, I think it's so important that when we, when we establish these mentoring programs that we take into consideration the diversity of the mentees. And, um, and, and so, as I said, one of the most important roles uh, that uh, I have is continuing to hit the button down because 
you know, there aren't that many Latinos in my line of business. Uh, and so uh, when I'm hitting the elevator and bringing in new suppliers into the supply chain, my goal is to bring that diversity aside. I'm, I'm going after, you know, uh, uh, um, when I took when I talk diversity, we're talking women business owners, African American business owners, Latinos, Asian Americans, LGBT veterans, and to see that spark happen when you're able to make that great connection that will actually translate in more um, business for that particular business owner is phenomenal. I think, uh, uh, as I said, this is why. Uh, it, 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 it's so rewarding to see companies that started small and reached that 100,000 and then that $1 million mark. As you know, uh, diverse home companies, uh, um, uh, the majority, don't ever reach the $1 million mark. However, you look at the ones that have reached the $1 million mark, which is uh, uh, less than 3%, by the way, uh, when, uh, when, when you're looking at them, is what, what made them uh, separate? What do they have? What are the characteristics that make a successful uh, diverse business owner? And as I said, mentoring, finding the right mentor is key. There's other uh, barriers that we uh, teach uh, diverse owners to overcome when growing their businesses. But again, I go back to how successful these businesses are because of just that connection with not just one mentor, but several mentors. Yeah, that's a good point. Not just one mentor, mm -hmm. several mentors. And that brings me to mm -hmm. having a network, right? A lot of times mm -hmm. in the, and I wish they taught more of this in law school and business school, just in general, how to network, right? Because that is sometimes how you find your mentor, or you find your mentee is through networking. I'll tell you right now, we, we, you know, obviously we went through the whole lockdown of 2020 and, you know, there wasn't a lot of in-person events or interactions, but my network is legitimately how we did a lot of our business. We got a lot of referrals through networks. So if you're listening and you're thinking, oh, you know, how do I get a mentor or a mentee? Your network can also be the answer to that as well. I also wanted to touch a little bit about leadership. Um, I know you did an MBA program. I did an MBA program in addition to my law degree. And one of the things I'll tell you they didn't do in the program was not teach you how to lead with different personalities and emotions. <laughs> <laughs> the textbooks do not talk about that. So I want to know how did your understanding of leadership change from your academic to your career world experience? So I guess we'll start with uh, Tanya. Yeah, that's a good question, Kendra, because I don't know that anyone teaches you how to do leadership well. So you might do some case study, you might, you know, understand some really specific examples. Typically, it's leadership under crisis mode, right? In, in, in business school, that's usually what you're doing, or it's a turnaround situation, and there's this leader who kind of, you know, um, did an excellent job getting the team and the business through it. Um, from my perspective, I really do think leadership is much more around understanding the human connections. Um, how do you inspire teams to accomplish what they don't even think is possible? And, and that's mm -hmm. something that's always resonated with me. Um, as I think about you know, moving from a really technical role as an engineer who's an individual contributor who's just getting stuff done, to moving into leading teams and helping them accomplish a common mission or a common goal. I think the only, the, the way I've learned how to do that effectively um, is just by connecting with individuals and understanding individual people's personalities and their motivations and figuring out what that means when a team comes together to accomplish a goal. Like you said, you know, no one teaches you about the different, you know, the personalities and the drama that you deal with. And, um, if the pandemic hasn't taught us anything, it's the value of human connection because having to mm -hmm. then figure out to lead in a virtual environment where you can't touch and feel and laugh together in a way that's in person and, and very personal, um, it does help you really understand the importance of that human connection. So for me, leadership, yeah. and, and you don't learn this in business school, is, is much more about building that trust and, and that human connection to inspire and, and mm -hmm. keep teams moving together. In the time that we're living, uh, uh, every time that I'm going to be having a meeting with a with new person, by the way, uh, thank God for LinkedIn. I'll go immediately uh, uh, as soon as I'm having this meetings and schedule some time so that I can understand where this person is coming from. Um, uh, I deal with a lot of entrepreneurs and, uh, or, or, and also senior leaders within Wells Fargo. And so I, I, I always have an idea of who uh, these leaders are, what their backgrounds are. LinkedIn does a wonderful way of telling us, but there's also great articles 
when when you reach a certain position, chances are that there have been articles that have been written about you, and those interviews are phenomenal. That's consider myself like the Olivia Pope. Remember how she had a murder board of who was connected to what? And where there's a contact, there might be a contract for any entrepreneur. I, I'm always telling them and, and get to know who you're going to be speaking with and see what that human connection can be made. And people will remember you. People will remember that you actually took the time to get to know them a little bit more uh, and, and, and say, oh, my God, this person did this. And, 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 and it's a wonderful exercise, as I said, of doing that uh, relationship. Uh, as I said, when you're looking at what makes a successful business owner successful, it's obviously taking advantage of the trainings that are being offered, the mentoring, but then also networking where there is a contact, there is a contract. I, I, I keep sounding like, uh, like a fortune cookie here, but that actually works. As I said, get to know the people that you're going to be connecting with and don't be shy. As, I, as you mentioned, you were at, at a conference, you saw someone that you were really moved by. You said, I want this person to be a mentor. I do the same thing. I'm very fortunate uh, before the pandemic that I got to hear from amazing speakers and I actually befriended them <laughs> on LinkedIn and I, and I follow them. And there's so much knowledge, uh, 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 so many ideas that they share. They're giving you like a cliff notes of who they are and how you can connect with them. <laughs> yes, I am really big on LinkedIn. I think that is actually where I got um, my connection to Stephen Marley's team. That's one of our clients. And I met her through LinkedIn. And then, you know, <laughs> we built a relationship and he became a client. And so I am a mm -hmm. big believer in LinkedIn. I love it. And for me personally, I try to go beyond that as well. Like just taking mm -hmm. the time to understand the people for me as a leader, like understanding who's on my team, check in, how's your mom, how's your dad, how are you, how are you doing, you need mm -hmm. lunch, did you eat today, you know, things <laughs> like that. I'm a mom, right? So I'm constantly going after my kids and saying, did you eat, can you drink some water, did you, you know, and mm -hmm. I and I do that, I nurture and I love on my team, you know, I check in with them, mm -hmm. and, hey, did you have coffee, we need coffee, you need coffee, I'll Uber eats you some coffee, you know, just those mm -hmm. little things. I think are important because even though you're in the leadership position at the end of the day, if you have no team, who are you leading? Right. Who are you just mm -hmm. by yourself? Mm -hmm. I think Tanya mentioned that if no one's going to follow you, well, what, what, what's really happening here? So I think that's important mm -hmm. as well. Tanya, did you have something you want to add? I saw you nodding your head. You know, I, as you guys are talking about just, I love Sal's comment. If there's a contact, there's a contract. I am definitely going to mm -hmm. use that one because <laughs> those connections it is really much about thought leadership how you lead within a team how you lead your own work so i, I think when we think about leadership it goes beyond the title and kendra i think that's what you're saying is we have to make those human connections and that's how you inspire followership honestly i used to believe that leadership was something that uh, you can learn or you can be born with it depends i feel like it depends on the person right there's some people that are natural born leaders and some people mm -hmm. to me that have to learn to be leaders what are your thoughts mm -hmm. on that i think we need to hear from one of the highest ranking uh women african americans <laughs> at wells fargo yes. by the way so uh, as i said we have a one pound garbanzo uh, here and so we got to take advantage of, uh, you know, that leadership. Uh, we got to squeeze all that information, as I said. Uh, th this is very valuable information that I'm also taking notes. <laughs> you know, and Sal, he's so, he's so nice. I appreciate that. But, you know, I, what, I, what I think is, um, I think we have to have broader definitions of leadership. And, and here's what I experienced. So early in my career, and I think a lot of us do this, you try so hard to assimilate and to look and feel and be stylistically like the leader that you see in front of you. That may, we may not wear that well, right? It just may not fit on us. But if, if, we're, if we broaden our view of what a leader looks like, what a leader sounds like, how a leader engages, I think we can, um, I think we will find that we identify more leaders. So to your question, Kendra, is a leader born or are they made or can they be, you know, can they, can they learn, can people learn to be a leader? I think that we see leadership everywhere. I just think that sometimes our definitions of leadership are so constrained to what we've always seen as the example of leadership that we forget that we have many people who are leading from right where they are. Um, and, and leading is inspiring. Leading is getting things mm -hmm. done. Leading is knowing how to get things done without having the title and without having 
um, the power, right? And so, um, so, th so that's what, how I would answer the question. I, I also want to point out that, that what I'm seeing, not just at Wells Fargo, but in most Fortune 500 companies, there's all these changing demographics, and it's now Pedro, Maria, Kendra, Tanya, you're next, right? And, and you're, we're, we're now the leaders that we were expecting to be. And what a wonderful opportunity that now we bring innovation to these companies like Wells Fargo and beyond. The secret sauce, I think, as an economist speaking, to uh, why, why we're the strongest and, and the largest economy in, in human history, some would say, is because of the diversity that we bring in. And now to have great leaders uh, at Wells Fargo, like Tanya, and other diverse leaders, I think is what makes us a better company. Time and again, the studies have shown that those companies that have diversity at its leadership are more profitable. So as, again, I was raised by my grandmother, you know, and she would say, it's not the love of the pig, it's the love of the pork rinds. This is where it's coming now. This is where now we're going to see some very profitable companies. And those companies that are falling behind when it comes to the diversity of its leadership are going to be left by the wayside. You're looking at which are the companies that are most profitable, and you're going to see faces like the ones that are right here on screen. <laughs> Salvador, you invited me over for lunch. Is that what you're saying? I love that. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, so with that being said, do you think there are certain traits that leaders have, right? So for me, I feel that uh, one of the traits that I believe most great leaders have is the ability to um, read people, you know, to mm -hmm. to understand them without them saying anything. I think that's mm -hmm. a really important skill or trait that a leader has. What would you mm -hmm. say is one of the most important skills for you to as a leader? Yeah, I know. I'll, I'll add to that. So I, I think the ability to read people is one that would be on my list. I think being a good listener and mm -hmm. listening for the perspectives um, and the varying opinions. I think what mm -hmm. good leaders do well is they create an environment where the best ideas emerge to the top and the best decisions are made when you can hear all of the, the various perspectives around the table. Um, so listening, mm -hmm. I think, is, is fine. And then the other, the third one I'd add would be um, strong leaders are also curious. So they know how to ask mm -hmm. the question um, and they may not be the expert, but what they learn to do well is ask the questions and ask the questions of the people who can surface the ideas and the viewpoints that are going to help make a really solid decision, whatever business decision you're making. Okay, Salvador, I see you shaking your head. I, I think you had one that you wanted to add. What would you say would be one of those traits that you like from leaders? Leaders that inspire us, leaders that really go uh, and, 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 and touch you and say, you know, we can be better. We can be better in our community. We need to be part of the economic vitality of the communities where we serve, and we're going to do it this way. There's a lot of knowledge uh, 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 that can be shared, obviously. Uh, and, and so um, my, my pastime is... Uh, reading biographies of great leaders. And, and I'm fascinated, you know, how someone like President Barack Obama, for example, how he got and he surrounded himself, as Tanya mentioned, by very knowledgeable people. And, and, and so in and, and diversity of thought, uh, that is, I, I think, what inspires you, that you're actually open to new ideas, that you're open to a dialogue and a discussion where there will be a, a confrontation between point A and point B, and the best idea from that will come, and you're going to produce something that is great. It, it, as I said, uh, uh, it, it is through this dialogue of different thoughts that you get innovation. And any company that is married to innovation will succeed, any individual, as I said, also. <laughs> I love that. I think one of the things for me is leading by example. Like for, for mm -hmm. me, that's so important because a lot of times mm -hmm. people take on a role, a position, a title, and they forget that, okay, but these people are watching you, you know, your team's looking at you, mm -hmm. they're looking to see what you're doing. Um, or if, when you're the business owner, I, the other day we went to my brother's graduation and we were in Tampa and we visited this uh, restaurant, seafood restaurant, and we noticed this guy just walking around the restaurant, cleaning, fixing the tables. He was getting down and dirty behind the register. I mean, he yeah. had a team, but he was everywhere. And, you know, I said to my daughter, I said, who do you think that is? She's like, I have no clue, the manager. And so we called him over. We said, hey, is this your restaurant? He goes, yeah, this is mine. This is my restaurant. 
my son and I, we own it, and this is our first one, and we're hoping to have a franchise. And I and I said, you know, I can tell, you know, I can tell because he's showing his team this is what you need to do. This is, you know, after everyone leaves, this is how you wipe out. He's not just telling them, he's showing them. And I think that's a mm-hmm. key component of a successful leader is that they're not only able to, you know, guide and motivate, but they're also able to show because a lot, especially mm-hmm. you guys know you have kids, a lot of what, what your kids learn in the beginning is by looking at you, you know, mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. I feel that's an important part. Salvador, would leading say by example. Leading <laughs> by example. You, you, I'm, you, I'm leaving you, with you four L. lines. <laughs> and leading by example, you, you've given me some great tips. Wait, and where there's a contact, there's a contract. That needs to be on a T-shirt. If Wells Fargo does not trademark <laughs> that for you, I'm coming for it. <laughs> okay, so would you say along your way, are there some leaders? that you've looked up to that has helped shape you in your corporate career? And I'll be with uh, Tanya. No, again, Kendra, I think leading by example is, is a good way to lead into that one because there have been a number of um, leaders that I try to pull a little bit of what I like from all the leaders I've seen along the way. Um, and, and that's how I've tried to model my leadership. The leading by example whether it's um, inspire, trying to inspire, promote more innovative thinking and outside in thinking. I mean, that's really important for us um, at Wells Fargo. And it's it, it's bringing the diversity of thought and, and, and perspectives around the table, but it's also paying attention to what's going on outside the company. And so what mm-hmm. I try to do with my team is um, I will forward them articles, right? I, I see, you know, there's, this company is doing this and they're outside of banking and they're in technology and look at this cool thing that they did and here's how I could see it relating to our business. And that gets the team motivated to also share what they're learning. Um, I encourage my teams to continue learning, like don't stop learning, take classes, do workshops, watch mm-hmm. videos. And when I find cool ones that I've been exposed to and that I take the time um, to read or do a workshop, I'll share my notes or I'll, I'll share the link and just try to mm-hmm. model um, expectations that I have for my team on that front. And I've had leaders along the way who have done that for me. And so those are some of the things that I've picked up along the way that I try to do with my teams. One of my first jobs was an intern at the U.S. Department of Commerce uh, and Secretary Ron Brown uh, had uh, 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 been appointed to, to be the Secretary of Commerce. He was the first African-American to lead uh, this particular agency. Uh, and there was a, a late night that we were working on a briefing book and uh, uh, it was the interns and uh, Secretary of Commerce uh, 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 that were all working together pretty late at night, by the way. Uh, he was working on, on something. And um, fast forward, uh, just last year, uh, I was awarded. Uh, he died in a plane a, a plane crash uh, doing a trade mission for, for the country and uh, a great leader, by the way. And I was awarded the Ron Brown uh, 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 Leadership Award because of my leadership working with minority owned companies. And humble brag, but no, the, the, the point here is that we have uh, the opportunity to be touched by great people. But I, I, I remember distinctly, not that Secretary Brown was there, but we had made a mistake. <laughs> Another intern had taught me how to do a specific uh, way of uh, formatting a, a document. To this day, I still remember the margin, the, air, uh, the, mar- the, the errors in the margins, by the way. It's interesting, Th- there's knowledge everywhere. I, I, and yes, uh, uh, as I said, uh, Secretary Brown w- was phenomenal, but I still remember the entry said, no, you're doing the margins wrong, by the way. And, and no one had actually taken the time to teach me how to do a formal document. It's been more than 20 years later, and I still remember those margins. Wow. <laughs> I think that's a good key right there, I guess, to, <laughs> as a leader, knowing that you can still learn from others and always keep learning as you go along the way. One of the ways that I help improve my leadership skills is by Mm -hmm. reading. Mm -hmm. I read a lot of books on leadership, but also a lot of books on self-development, like developing myself Mm -hmm. has actually made me a better leader for my team. I think that's one of Mm -hmm. the things that I enjoy doing is improving myself and looking back and Mm -hmm. seeing the growth um, for me as I go along on my journey as a leader as well. You know, you were mentioning how you read. Uh, can you tell us, for example, um, um, I have favorite authors that 
I'm actually one of those weirdos that actually on Amazon has the pre-order book, by the way. And so when it appears, I get all excited, like if it was Christmas, because the new book has arrived from uh, the people that I actually enjoy reading, by the way. And, I, and, and so uh, I, I, um, uh, are you able to share which one's your favorite, like, a uh, uh, book that is on leadership that you're like, oh my God, that one was phenomenal. Uh, uh, or, 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 or any, any, any bit of information would be great. By the, the way, I, I, I could tell you that I'm a huge fan of Scott Galloway. He did one recently on the post corona economy. I, uh, um, my wife actually had to come at, at three o'clock in the morning and say, stop reading, come to bed. I was like, I'm almost done with it. <laughs> and I, I, the next day I had to write some talking points and I actually, you know, uh, borrowed some of uh, some of the ideas that he was sharing on the post corona economy uh, because I was doing a speech before uh, small business owners. Uh, and, and, and it's that type, that level of excitement that that, that really you know, kind of like full, fuels my, the, the, you know, my, my thirst for knowledge. <laughs> I'm going to share with you the book I'm currently reading. It's it's not on the leadership end, but it's almost like financial entrepreneurish. It's uh, mm -hmm. We Should All Be Millionaires by Rachel Rogers. And yes, yeah, she is a former lawyer. <laughs> She's now in this space. So I love that book because I think a lot of women business owners don't really get to that level. And so I love that mm -hmm. she lays a roadmap and she shares her story. I don't know if you've ever heard of her, but it's called We Should All Be Millionaires by Rachel Rogers. No, that's a good one. I'll add that one to my list. Um, I've heard of I've I've heard of Rachel Rogers, but I haven't read that book. Um, I, I am an avid reader too. And when people ask, "What do you do in your free time?" or "If you got a free hour," my answer is always, "I'd be sitting somewhere with a book," <laughs> because I always am finding that you know there's something I want to catch up on. And I am typically, I will admit, all over the map. I read for different reasons. Sometimes for leisure, just to unplug from the business and financial topics. Um, sometimes I'll dive deep into something I'm really interested in and that I saw a documentary on and I want to dive further. I've been doing that a lot with climate change recently. So there have been a couple of books around climate change that I've been digging into. But some of my favorite authors, um, Sal, to your question, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, um, Adam Grant, you know, some of the research that they do around business mm -hmm. and around team and just people, um, that those are the, those are some of the authors that I read uh, repeatedly whenever something new comes out. Salvador, you said you had a book, books in your cart. What books are you reading on your end that you wouldn't mind sharing? With us? Uh, well, the the one that I that, that I just finished uh, is uh, um, uh, as I told you the uh, the one in the post corona economy. There's another one. <laughs> Again, I was listening to a podcast and how to limit how, how to limit your social media. Uh, uh, the time that you spend on social media is it, a uh, ten reasons to to erase uh, your social media accounts and and, and, and and you know reading is great but it's it, it's amazing the amount of time that we are spending on, on, on social media yes it is important but uh by you eliminating that part of uh, uh not all of it but some part of it you're able to dedicate more time to other stuff other important stuff we we find ourselves where we are in front of a computer spending a lot of time and and, and, and as i said social media does consume a lot of time if you're able to eliminate some of it and dedicate it to other resources I, I, according to uh what the book is telling us uh we will be better people for it i can agree to that i think a, a lot of social media has taken not just our time but changed the way we view ourselves and even our real life right because on social media people's lives are totally different from their real life or as my kids would say that you're catfishing right <laughs> <laughs> so I think, you know, <laughs> bringing people back to that reality, but I think it's also, again, because I'm in that millennial space where I remember what the internet was before it became social media, I think um, there's a lot of pressure for people to appear perfect on the internet, mm -hmm. and it's so easy for them to do so, and I think that probably aids to that negative effect, but it's also a great way to connect, right? I have family in mm -hmm. Guyana, yeah. which is in South America that I've not seen in years. And that mm -hmm. is the way, the way we connect, you know, we update through social media. So it has its pros mm -hmm. and its cons. What about you, Tanya? Are you, are you taking a social media diet over there? You know, um, I haven't, I never really jumped on the bandwagon. So I am on um, social media, LinkedIn. I definitely a huge fan of LinkedIn from a professional perspective and connect, keeping connections going um, from a, within business. Um, I'm on Twitter primarily for the news. Um, and mm -hmm. then when you're out and out 
especially when you're traveling, it's the fastest way to figure out what's going on in that local area. Um, I found it to be really helpful, like for those Disney trips <laughs> with the kids, believe it or not, so Twitter <laughs> helpful for that. Um, and then I just got on Facebook, just got on Facebook, like literally in the past couple of months, mainly because of my kids. So they're doing all these sporting act um, events and um, practices and games and traveling. And the world is set up now where you can't even keep up with where your kids are going or how things are going without being on social media to get those updates. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the primary reasons that I've, I've started to embrace it a little bit more. I'm sure I'll get better, um, but I've, I've always tried to preserve my time because I can see how it can be a black hole. <laughs> and you, you know, you kind of look 30 minutes later and you're just trying to check one post, you know? So that's been my experience with social media. Do you, I'm just curious, do you feel that social media has impacted the financial world in a way since you've, uh, you know, you interact on LinkedIn and Facebook? Have you seen a change or a shift in your industry based upon what you're seeing on social media? Yes, absolutely. And that's actually one of the reasons why I've, you know, had to shift my mindset on using social media because our customers are on social media. Um, if if mm -hmm. they're having a customer issue they're on social media but if we're doing a new mm -hmm. product launch it's one of the ways that we're getting that information out to our customers so social media has definitely um, become a critical part not just from a marketing perspective uh, but also when we think about customer service and getting real-time updates out to our customers you, you must have been familiar with the paycheck protection program and how it was established to provide funding for small business owners so that they could actually cover their payroll uh, social media played a very important role in getting the message out so that small and diverse business owners were able to understand how Paycheck Protection Program was uh, uh, going to be uh, executed. And then equally important, what were the steps that were needed in order for it to become from a, a loan to a grant? Uh, um, I, unfortunately, uh, we find ourselves where a lot of diverse owned companies were not able to, to take advantage of the Paycheck Protection Program. However, those that were a little bit more active in social media were able to secure funding through the Paycheck Protection Program. So it is that type of immediate knowledge uh, because there's small windows of opportunity. So uh, it's a double-edged sword. Don't spend too much time, but spend the right time amount in it and go for the quality, right? Although sometimes it's good to follow what's going on with the gossip, it's entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you admit that part. I definitely do follow the gossip, but not because I enjoy it, but because, you know, mm -hmm. I can find information on my clients or something, you know? Definitely not yeah, for the sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some, and I know you guys have been in the financial world for a while now. So what do you feel are the key guiding principles that have helped you navigate the financial world, in addition, obviously, social media helps. But what are some of the other principles you guys have applied? So as far as navigating uh, the financial world, I think it comes down to understanding your business and knowing mm -hmm. who those experts are in your field, um, whether it's in banking or within the industries that you're supporting, and just being connected to the subject matter experts. So, you know, mm -hmm. like we talked about earlier, you can't know everything. But you can certainly surround yourself with a network of people who all encompassing can get you the information that you need. So I do think having that broad network um, for information and for knowledge is important. Um, we talked about the human connection, and I think that that is critical for any leader um, in, in within any team. You need that trust where people can collaborate and work together to get things done and get things done quickly in a lot of cases. Um, and then for me, I think, you know, just being willing to try different things. Um, I started out in a completely different space. Um, once I got into financial services, I started out doing business development and reviewing portfolios because it was a natural transition of skill set. But over time, I did roles in sales and in operations. Um, and now I have the opportunity to lead a business. And it's only because um, I took the time throughout my career to try different roles, try different sectors, and put that all together into a portfolio of skills and experiences. So navigating the financial um, and business world, I don't think that there's you know one magic bullet or one you know, um, secret formula. I think we all do it a little bit differently, but that's what's worked for me. 
So it, 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 it's understanding the data around the work that you're doing. Um, the census data is phenomenal. It comes out, you know, on a regular basis and it lets us know how the United States as a country is changing. How, for example, we had record number of applicants uh, for new small business opportunities. And you look a little bit more and you dig deeper and you find out that it's African American women and Latina business owners that are driving the force here in the creation of new jobs uh, it, 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 and uh, new businesses. So when we're looking to work with these ladies, uh, we want to make sure that we're offering them the right services, that we are tailoring the, uh, uh, the products and services that we offer to this particular group because the needs of, of an African-American entrepreneur are very different than that of a non-African-American female entrepreneur. So when we're bringing subject matter experts, we want to make sure that this magical thing happens. We, we have a, a particular program with African-American female entrepreneurs where we bring in African-American subject matter experts and magic happens. I, I step away from it. There's no need for a Y chromosome to be hanging around there. And, and I, I, I'm in the back just listening in and magic happens. There's such a connection and you, and, and you just feel so excited for the future of all the great opportunities and all the great innovation that is coming from the minds of these business leaders that happen to be female, that happen to be African-American or Latina or Asian-American. The, the future looks very uh, 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 bright with these individuals and, and the creation of these uh, uh, great businesses, by the way. I love that you mentioned that you saw it coming. You saw the, the, the wave coming, and that's something that we do a lot in our firm. We saw the wave coming. We went virtual before it was a need to go virtual. And mm -hmm. that is an important part of working and adapting to the diverse communities that you serve. I know we're almost out of time, so I want to thank you both for sharing your personal and professional journey with us. I've had such a good time. What is one takeaway you'd like to leave with your audience and peers today? Yes. Um, so I think the one takeaway I would leave is there's no one perfect um, formula for how to do this. Um, lean in to what you're really good at. And then if it doesn't work, try something new. You can use your network to get feedback, uh, work with mentors, but just be willing to learn, um, try your best as you're going through your career to stay on course with your goals, with your learning um, in, in getting into leadership roles. But if, if it's not going the way you expect, expect it, pivot and try something different. And I think that we've talked a lot about um, different ways to do that. And you, Salvador? For me, it, uh, it is as leaders, we have the opportunity, as I said before, to continue to send the elevator down and bring more leaders that look like you, like me, uh, we, to keep the door open, to invite diversity of thought into the work that we're doing. Uh, we, we find, I, at least I find myself in a very privileged position that I have the opportunity to keep on pressing that button over and over and over, and over or keeping the door open so that new leaders, the le leaders that are in the making are gonna be uh, coming and that we're able to actually help them out. As I said, there's the mentoring opportunities, but also to make sure that uh, they feel comfortable uh, and, and that we squash that imposter syndrome that sometimes uh, plagues uh, diverse leaders. Yes, both of you have left with really good um, takeaways. I think the only thing I would add is if you're in that position, that's the position you were meant to be in and you own mm -hmm. that position and you give it your all and you do your best because there is someone else that is always looking and watching and is always going to be impressed by what you do, even if you think mm -hmm. you messed up. And I think that's when we drop the mic, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you to my guests. Thank you, Tanya Saunders. Thank you so much, Salvador Enriquez. This has been a great conversation and I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I have.